very important moment in the program because the market is crying for exits, right? We need to sell these little companies that we created. And there's a gentleman who sold his company to a big company. He's called Harry Böhme. He was in Berlin at the Eco Summit in 2011, and now he will tell you the story of Novalet. Okay. Welcome to Eco Summit, Harry. Thank you very much for inviting me again. I'm Harry Böhme. Um, unfortunately, it was not my company, um, at least not alone, so <laughs> um, I need to correct that first. Uh, thanks for inviting me again. I have been in Berlin, as you said. Um, Novelet, the older growth story, I want to tell you a little bit about the company and also about the, exes we uh, the exit we just uh, made uh, recently. Um, Novelet at a glance, just a few words. We were founded in 2001 as a spin-off of the university, the Technical University of Dresden. Um, turned the company into a stock operation in March 2006, uh, basically with, uh, with a view on the potential exit uh, for the investors. We are a leading provider of customized OLED stack solutions uh, based on the Novelet pin technology, and I will tell you a little bit about this technology later on. 2012, we had revenues of 27 million uh, after something like 20 million in uh, 2011. We are profitable since 2011, um, venture capital funded. We had three rounds of financing. The last one of that was in 2009. We have more than 500 patents. I'm sorry. We have more than 500 patents uh, and patent applications in more than 90 uh, different families. Um, 135 people as of today, basically a mix of physics and uh, chemists. Um, our headquarters in Dresden, and we have offices in Korea and Japan. As I said, I need to give you a little bit of technology. Um, what is an OLED? An OLED basically is a substrate, normally a piece of glass. You apply layers of organic material on it, normally by vapor deposi deposition, but also by printing. Um, you apply power to it. Electrons and holes move through the two layers, which are here in green and red. They move to the, through the two layers. They recombine in the emitting layer and by that emit light. Basically, the only area light source in the world that exists, which is not a punctual light source like an LED or a strip. It's really light generated from an, from an area. So... What do we make of it by our technology and by our materials? You see the OLED stack uh, there. We are concentrating basically on the green and on the red layer on this picture. These are the transport layers of the OLED, which transport the electrons and holes. And we are doping these layers by organic material in order to make these layers more efficient. So electrons and holes travel through these layers more efficient with less losses, and by that you have a more energy efficient OLED. Why is an OLED? And basically we are addressing two markets, two applications, display and lighting. The more important currently is the display, and I think it makes sense to explain uh, why OLED is a superior technology over LCD, as you can see there, the green part is the LCD, where you have basically a lot of different layers which make the display, starting with a light source in the back uh, with uh, polarizer filters and other things. And below you have the OLED, where you do not have a separate light source, but you just have the piece of glass, then you apply the layers of material, and the same medium which creates the light also creates the picture, because every single pixel is one OLED, which again generates light in a certain color, and by that, by the combination of pixels, you have your display. So you have a superior picture quality, you have lower power consumption, because if you want to have black, you just switch off the pixel, instead of like in an LCD where, you, where it is still switched on, and you block it by, by the filter. You have an increased product lifetime, thinner form factor that's quite sure, faster response time, and in fact the manufacturing is or will be simpler 
than compared to an LCD. As I said, we are basically targeting two markets, the display and the lighting market. For both markets, it's important uh, that we will be that the technology is energy saving compared to existing technologies, but you also have, especially in lighting, and I will come to that, design features which you can not have with existing light sources today. In terms of revenue, in terms of the business in front of us, as you can see here, um, it is expected that AM OLED, um, active, active Matrix, OLED revenues will grow by a factor of three uh, in the next seven years. Uh, as you can see here, based on the products we have here, for example, the, the curved uh, um, OLED 55-inch TV presented by Samsung uh, last year and also this year on the IFA, you have the same from LG. As you can see, uh, the full Galaxy telephone range, for example, uh, um, produced by Samsung, is using OLED and is using our products and our material and our technology. Um, but you also have cameras um, using for their displays OLED. You have, for example, other manufacturers like HTC using OLED displays. And again, uh, Samsung with a tablet. Um, this is a brand new product from Samsung, which you just may have seen, I think, last week. It's the curved uh, Samsung um, Galaxy phone, Galaxy Round. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good example of what we may expect from using OLED displays in the future. I think we will see a lot of products, and I think the curved display is only one of them. I think we will see a lot of products in the future which are really different from the, from the products we have today and which are basically enabled by the use of OLED. Curved is one example. Foldable, flexible, transparent even will be different examples. And I think we will see a lot of that uh, in the near future. Samsung certainly is a driver of this technology with over 90% of market share in the display production in OLED currently. Lighting, you see three different or even four different assumptions on where the revenue is going. At least all the curves are going up. No one really knows how fast lighting, uh, the lighting industry based on OLED technology will develop. At least no one predicts it's going down. I think that's a very important point. So at least we're in the, in the upstream here. But what makes lighting, OLED for lighting more important is I think that it will definitely modify the value chain. As you can see, when we're talking about lighting and when we're talking about the lighting industry, we are always talking about uh, the big three uh, vendors, Philips, Osram, and GE, basically making up the lighting business. In fact, what they do is they own, they kind of own the lamp business, which is the light source. But as you can see from the middle part of the picture, the lamp, the light source business, is only a smaller part of the total lighting business. The, mo the biggest part is basically what we call the luminaire, which is, which is the housing of the lamp. This is, uh, as you can see here, $65 billion. This is more than 5,000 companies only in Europe concentrating on the luminaire. And if you go on the, to the right of the slide, you can, sh you can see that, that the usage of OLED will basically change this business dramatically. Because in the past you had a light source and you built something around it, which is your luminaire, which is your, your, your lighting application. With an OLED, you can basically take four tiles, glass, and you put it into a kind of box like that, and you have your, your lighting device. So the lamp is the device. That will definitely change the market, and uh, we, are, we are there. Jan asked me to talk about the exit, so that's what we do. August 9, 2013, we signed an agreement. We is the sellers, the shareholders of the company, and the company, we signed an agreement uh, with Chale Industry, which is a uh, daughter company of Samsung, Samsung Electronics, Samsung Ventures, and the current shareholders about the sale of all shares in the company. Closing is expected basically today, and I can tell you that two hours ago, closing occurred. So the money is there. I haven't seen it actually. <laughs> I haven't seen it actually, but uh, I was told it's there. 
Um, transaction values, the company had a total of 260 million. And if you have seen what I saw, uh, what I saw, uh, this is 10 times value 2012 and 100 times profit 2012. Um, success factors, I think this is something we, we really should talk about. Basically, the first success, uh, success factor is the team, 135 young professionals, the average age in our company of the people is 35, um, brought up by the managers, which are all above 50. <laughs> so, um, combination, and I think that's very important, the combination of know-how in physics and chemistry. Physics, we are dealing, about, uh, we are dealing with light and, and the production of light and the extraction of light out of, out of an OLED. But chemistry, we are dealing with material which are basically used to build the OLED, supported by a lean and efficient team in marketing, sales, IP and business administration. I come to what Hendrix told about capital efficiency. I think we have been very capital efficient in the past. We have a very efficient team. However, this comes to some thresholds when it comes to a process like the one we just did over the last 18 months, which was basically trying to sell the company. And uh, it's, it's very good to be capital efficient and lean, but sometimes it's also very difficult to be lean if you talk with, I don't know, a number of, uh, of potential buyers of the company, you do due diligence and other things. That's, that costs a lot of resources. Um, second success factor, certainly the investors. We are basically backed or were basically backed by, by leading German and French venture capital companies. Um, Technostart was mentioned already before by you. Um, I think that's, that's, that's really one of the key factors. For example, when we in 2008, 2009, in the middle of the financial crisis, raised money or wanted to raise money for our third financing round, we were, we were going around in conferences talking to, to venture capital investors until uh, with the lead of eCapital, uh, the investor said, okay, we stop that, we don't want you to shop around anymore. We do the round, we put in more money, and basically they financed a round of 15 million euros in 2009, which really released us for at least one or two years from going out and, and searching uh, for money. Very important. And basically in 2011, Samsung Ventures, uh, the, the venture capital arm of Samsung, entered the shareholding of the company. Also a very important move because it gave us a lot of visibility uh, also towards new investors because they, they knew that if by its venture arm is investing in the company, it's a kind of, of um, justification of the business case. Industry focus, we had a very strong and early focus on manufacturing customers uh, combined with a very strong quality management. We even started manufacturing our own uh, lighting device, the Victory Lamp, which you can see here. We really made the, the, we really made the, the way through the whole manufacturing of actually a product. Very important. Very, we, we learned a lot by that, I can tell. Um, exposure to the financial community, that's mostly me, um, speaking on numerous conferences over the last uh, 20, 30 years, really uh, um, raising the attention uh, 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 with investors, recognized by a number of awards. These are only three of them. I think it's more than 10 or 15 over the last years. But that really gives you, gives you attention uh, in the financial community. Um, not the last, but, but one before the last, we prepared an IPO at the Nasdaq, because we basically wanted to open an exit route for our existing investors, um, which gave us high, high interest from potential investors, but also, and I think that's more important, really brought us to, a, to another level of professionalism, because we really turned around every stone in the company preparing the project, uh, sorry, preparing the prospect and, and every other thing. So that really was a very helpful exercise Unfortunately, it was very expensive. Uh, finally, it brought us basically to a point where Samsung said, okay, before the company may go IPO, we rather buy it. And I think one of the, the last success factors, something which you sometimes need, is just fortune. We made a lot of decisions over the last six years in a market where no one knows where it is going. And I think we had a lot of fortune sometimes. Um, but 
always remember fortune favors the bold. So obviously we did a lot of things right and I think uh, that finally led to this uh, successful um, exit. I took two minutes and 45 seconds, too much, unfortunately, but thank you very much for your attention. Do you have a question for Harry? Okay, Henrik. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, congratulations. I mean, it's fantastic news, and I think you worked really hard to get here. Um, it's great news for the whole industry. And uh, I'm very pleased that you're talking about it. Uh, one question that I think a lot of startup has is you took in Samsung, Samsung Ventures. It's one of your investors relatively late in the day. And I think there are a lot of talks and a lot of nervousness about bringing in people who are potentially the acquirer of your business. Can you talk about your thinking process going through that? I think it was the, the, the point which made us accept uh, that was that, as I said before, the venture arm of the most important um, manufacturer in the field, market share of more than 90%, investing into your company is a great validation of what you did. So I think that was very important. That was really the point where we and also where the shareholder said, yes, that's the right thing to do. We then negotiated, and that was another precondition of our shareholders, to say we are definitely limiting uh, the shareholding of corporate investors, and one of them was uh, Samsung, in that field, uh, or from that field to an absolute maximum of 10%, which basically allows you to prevent uh, blocking other uh, um, other um, investors to come into the company. And for Samsung Ventures, I, Samsung Ventures, I definitely had to say they have not been on the board, on the on the supervisory board, but they were observers, and they, I think, they really helped the company uh, in the years 2011, 12, and 13 until to the point where we are. So from that point of view. Um, we, we had these concerns, we thought about that, I think we found uh, good ways to circumvent them, and therefore it worked. If Samsung wasn't the acquirer of the business, what, what do you think would have happened then? Because I think that, that's I think, what in people's heads. So, you know, it's one thing if, you, if you're on the clear path that Samsung, Samsung mm, has 90% okay. mm. of the, the, your I market. Think, I think for us that was not... The problem, as I said before, we, we were preparing an IPO at NASDAQ and we have, uh, we have uh, continued to work on that. We, we were ready basically in the middle of 2012 and then the NASDAQ went down due to the Facebook uh, IPO. We resumed that and we would have uh, uh, gone further on that route. Uh, one question. Could you say something about the rates of return for... For example, eCapital, who were a part of the company from the start almost. I cannot say exactly for each investor about the rate of return. What I can tell you is that over three years, 29 million of venture fund, uh, not over three years, over three rounds of financing starting back in 2003, something like 29 million venture capital went in the into the company and the return, has, as you have seen, is 260 million, including an earn out of 30 million. Good enough. Thank you very much. I think it's, yeah. it's a nice result. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Harry, thank you very much. Both. Here's your speaker gift. Th thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, Thanks for inviting me again. Exactly. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>